Hey guys, happy new year. Welcome to today's podcast. I've got a fantastic guest for you today, uh, uh, someone from the medical professional field. So for all the audience out there, um, Dr. Gary Simmons, he's a brain surgeon. He's an author, professor, public speaker from North Carolina. So we're, co we're calling to you live from Houston, Texas and North Carolina. And today's talk is going to be all about inside the operating room, neurosurgery, medicine. He's got a lot of interesting thing about the not only the scientific aspects of neuroscience, but also the paranormal and spirituality. I love this topic, and it's going to be a great discussion. So, um, Gary, welcome. Well, thanks so much for having me, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. Well, uh, and, I, and I love having physicians on my show, um, you know, when they can, because their time is really limited. So kind of talk about your path to neurosurgery, what inspired you to choose that, and what you're doing now. Well, thanks. Uh, it's a, a fairly open topic there. <laughs> I will start by saying I have more time than I used to because uh, I did hang up the scalpel a few years ago. I uh, actually ironically had my own neurological illness really many years ago uh, and recovered pretty well, but was getting a fair amount of echoes uh, late in my career there, uh, some double vision, some trouble with uh, clumsiness in my hands, um, particularly when I was really fatigued. And I thought that is probably not the best conditions to be doing my surgery with. So uh, so I, now I am predominantly writing, but I'm also teaching undergrads and med students at Virginia Tech, doing a lot of neuroscience teaching with them. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I uh, went into neurosurgery, I guess, out of slightly different uh, background where I was really considering uh, the ministry. And I was kind of a biochemistry and religion major in college, and somehow I swung to the medical side and, and went from there. And then in med school, like a lot of us, I'm sure, um, you know, went through multiple iterations of what I was going to be. But I, I love telling the story, particularly to the med students and pre-meds, that I was going to be a cardiothoracic doc in the end. I mean, I, I had my residency lined up and all that. And in my last rotation in medical school, I saw my first brain operation and I went, oh, my God, I have got to do that. So I, I'm there switching horses in midstream, literally, uh, you know, running about trying to find a residency and uh, had no idea what I was getting myself into and, and definitely got myself into a lot. And I always tell the students, you know, I, I still believe very much in following your heart when choosing a specialty, but probably do a little more research th than I did. <laughs> and so, you know, then I was I was very busy neurosurgeon at first in the army and then at major medical centers and trauma centers and ran the the neurosurgery program and residency program at uh, Virginia Tech Carilion in, in Virginia for 16 years or so. And then, as I said, hung up the, uh, the scalpel a few years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting. And, um, like I said, you know, we have, um, med students, we got residents, we got, you know, practicing attendings listening on. And, um, so kind of shares just some pivotal moments that shaped your journey, um, your view of medicine, um, just healthcare is changing just, you know, and so I'm just curious to see what you you're seeing from your side of things. Yeah, another <laughs> another huge topic. Uh, I was lucky, you know. I kind of came in the golden age. I think of of uh, operative neurosurgery. You, you know, kind of all the stars aligned, where we were still doing big brain operations, um, but we had a lot of technological support and anesthesia support and stuff like that. And I was brought up, uh, you know, surrounded by great people. I trained at Walter Reed. I was in the army at the time and I trained at Walter Reed and was surrounded by just great fellow residents and, and attendings. I was an attending there as well. Um, so I, I always had a very rosy eyed picture of healthcare uh, and healthcare delivery because I think there, particularly in the military, I mean, we were paid not too much, but uh, enough. And uh, we never worried about whether our patients could pay or not. And, you know, they, it was basically some form of socialized medicine, I guess. And we just did our job and did it as best we could. And 
uh, I went out into the real world and still went into nonprofits, Geisinger, and then this Carilion Healthcare System in, in Virginia, both of which uh, were in the clinic model. And again, kind of salaried, socialized style medicine, um, uh, taking all comers, big trauma centers. Uh, and so I always felt like I was part of the good guys, you know, but I, I started seeing a lot of profiteering and there's certainly a lot of profiteering even, you know, amongst neurosurgeons, particularly in spine surgery, where you really start questioning the, uh, the motivations behind some of the surgery. So I, I guess, you know, I, I eventually got a slightly more jaded picture, but I always saw us as good guys and we were doing great stuff. And now, now neurosurgery is getting more and more minimally invasive and more is being done through catheters and stuff like that. So these big brain operations, which of course were more taxing on the patients, but they were more interesting and, and more fun from my side of the equation. Yeah, uh, it's quite interesting because you have to see these to actually, um, you know, actually experience it. And how do you, especially in such a high stake, intricate procedure, how do you prepare mentally and emotionally? Yeah, it's a, it's an experience, and uh, I think everybody's doing it differently, potentially. Uh, one of the first things, though, is you've got to kind of clear your head one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, we even experimented with some mindfulness exercises and stuff uh, for a while there um, just to see if it had any impact. And it did seem to have some positive impact. I was never very good at that stuff myself. But, you know, in, in that world, in a, in a place like the places I worked, there was stuff going on nonstop. You know, the helicopters were coming in, terribly injured people all about. Our outcomes, neurosurgical outcomes, aren't the best on earth. So, you know, you you may leave an ICU patient who's doing very badly and you're feeling at least partially responsible and you got to go down and then, you know, leap into another operation. Sometimes I would do three, four, five operations in a day. Uh, and sometimes you're up all night as well doing a bunch of emergency operations. So anyway, I, I think one of the key things is you you got to leave all that other stuff at the door and really zero in on on the, the patient at hand. And I guess it, it was easier somewhat in our sphere, you know, as soon as everything's at least set up, we're either under loops or we're under a microscope. So your world really hones down to this very small space. And, and there's a lot of living and dying going on in that little small space. So it is kind of easy to forget everything for a little while there. It's also, it was always a refuge because the minute you would step out, the, the pager or the phone would be going off, five people would be grabbing at you and saying, we got this emergency and this problem and that problem. And you, you know, in the OR at least, you could, you could just focus in on one problem at a time. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, it's just kind of, um, kind of like zen in and honing down and just saving the patient's life and you know all the other stuff like notes and you know orders and all that you know um this is that's kind of been you know what medicine healthcare has become um and then kind of talk about you know loss and mistakes because this is a field where everything's so high and deal with the you know loss and complications um how do you cope with these situations and advice um would you give to people going through such experiences, you know, in training, et cetera? Yeah, it's uh, for the, I don't know, the past 15 years or so, I've been working a lot in the realm of burnout uh, and trying to build resilience and wellness and healthcare providers. And I have three books on it. And I actually have a novel that very much focuses in on uh, some of the, the concepts that you're just uh, alluding to, but uh, it's rough. It, you know, it, 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 at least neurosurgery is a rough and tumble field uh, with a lot of bad outcomes. And, you know, we have to admit to ourselves that we contribute to those bad outcomes sometimes. You know, we're, we're, we're all fallible. We all can make mistakes. And, you know, it can be the simplest of errors, but you are going to ride that out for days and days uh, if you feel like, you know, you in any way contributed to the patients. And even when it's obvious you didn't contribute to a bad outcome, you still take kind of an internal responsibility about it. So, you know, when we, we were studying burnout uh, within our own group and other neurosurgeons, 
um, what rose to the the top, and we gave them lists of like 70 or 80 typical stressors in the job. And what always raised to the top was bad outcomes and uh, errors. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think one of the first things that we have to do is just acknowledge that we take these hits, that, uh, you know, we we are human beings and we can't just drive through them. And that's kind of what we tend to do is just lower our heads and drive, but we're taking hits along the way. And I think it's good every so often to acknowledge it and say, look, you know, this is, this is uh, damaging me to one degree or another, and I have to find ways to, to repair. Uh, so some of which, and, and, and the repair is going to be different from person to person. What is, you know, what works particularly well for one person may not work for another, but certainly, you know, breaks in the action, you know, even frontline troops get breaks in the action. And we in medicine have a tendency to just go, 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 right. You know, nonstop, take more call, do more, you know, uh, clinics, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, getting, getting a break in the action periodically, hopefully even daily. Daily, uh, but also, you know, minor breaks in the week, big breaks in the months, all that sort of thing, I think is really important. I think it's also really helpful to have a supportive group that you're working with or colleagues that you're working with, because nobody understands the situation better than fellow colleagues. And to be able periodically to be able to debrief and and talk with a colleague and and just say hey you know i am feeling pretty rough after what's happened uh this week and you don't necessarily need to relive every detail of a case that's gone bad but yeah. to be able to say god this is this is really keeping me up at night and it it's amazing how powerful it is to have a partner you know and particularly people you respect say hey i've been there I'm sorry, or or to even offer it up front without, you know, without him being solicited. Somebody says, hey, I heard, you know, something went bad in the OR. You know, that sucks. <laughs> and, and just to hear somebody else say that sucks is, you know, really goes a long way. Yeah. So I there are many different ways, but I think start by just acknowledging that that you can't just sail through it uh, and think that everything's going to be rosy. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the uh, just looking at the uh, NFL quarterback. You know, it's, he takes hits and just like you know, those one of those hits could be career ending. And it's like it's like it's um, what what do you what what um techniques do you do to heal emotionally with all that emotional trauma? You know, that guilt, that sadness, that loss, that grief. You know, is it just um, you know, I, I know you talked about um talking with colleagues. Any other you know one or two tips you can share? Yeah, I, I, certainly that one piece of advice I we might call debriefing our stressors, uh, and that is to face the stressors um, and and be able to discuss them openly. But we're always more concerned with our responses to the stressors, not the actual details of the stressors, but how are we responding? And is there a way we can respond more positively? So if we're going home and kicking the dog and, and you know, screaming at everybody, is there a different way we could do that? Would it help to meditate? Would it help to go, you know, a few rounds with a punching bag? Would it be good to go to a gym? You know, whatever. Can we do can we uh, respond to our stressors a different way? But another thing that we always believe in complementing uh, even more than the, the debriefing of stressors would be what we call collecting uplifts. And yeah. you know, in, in the field of medicine, I think we train ourselves to look for bad things. I mean, I, that's we spend so much of our time always looking for when the boot's going to drop. So even when a case goes well, we don't all run around and high five. We're like, okay, what the hell can go wrong now? You know, what, what is going to bite us in the butt? And, and we should be doing that. I mean, that's our job. We should anticipate what could go wrong. But what that does is it completely channels our brain to the negative side of of our lives and i think what we what is a really good exercise for example is um what we would have people do is make themselves for two three weeks at a time make themselves 
notice a few things that happen good during the day and write them down or put them in your phone, but, but make yourself do it so that, you know, I've got a count of five things today that went nicely. A nurse thanked me, a patient smiled, a, a patient's family hugged me. Somebody being, we, we've been working on for three weeks, actually got out of the hospital. These things are happening. So notice a few, make yourself notice a few, write them down. And what's kind of neat is you do rechannel your brain. You do rechannel your mind. And after a few weeks, what happens is you start noticing them a priori. You don't have to force yourself. They just start popping up into your consciousness. And you begin to realize that it's not all doom and gloom, that you actually are making an impact, that people are thankful, that people are getting better. Uh, and and I think that's a really good counterweight. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And then kind of um, talk about, because um, you, you also integrate uh, paranormal, and which is interesting, and also spirituality with neuroscience, kind of um, uh, talk about how you find this intersection fascinating and how you find the balance between science and spirituality impacts healthcare and wellness. Yeah, I'll, uh, I probably won't hit the paranormal quite yet in <laughs> that that's kind of another channel that was really a, a function of the novel I wrote. But but the spirituality side of it, uh, religion and spirituality, I guess it's always been kind of an interest for me. And and what's really kind of interested me along the way is how both sides kind of denigrate each other and shut each other down and assume that, you know, the other must be completely full of it and and <laughs> and and don't give each other credence. And we're particularly, I think we in medicine and certainly in neuroscience, we, we we're particularly guilty of this. I think we 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 have tremendous hubris in in thinking that we've got the answer for everything. I mean, it's all figured out. If it's not figured out, we will figure it out. Uh, and and there's no room for anything that is beyond our senses or at least our you know our uh, technology technological sensors or whatever. We're so dismissive. But I think you know one of the things that that you learn in neuroscience is what a limited piece of machinery our brains are. I mean, our brains are miraculous and they do amazing things and all that. I know that. But they also are very limited. They they screen out much of our environment. They present to us, basically our world is presented to us kind of as stories uh, in which we can function better. But it it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one representative uh, representation of, of reality. So I, I come out of, you know, looking at all this and saying, well, you know, how do we expect these brains to explain everything? And even if they could explain everything, how do we expect these brains to understand everything? So I just give tremendous leeway to the the sense of sen of of spirituality or or religion for anybody and everybody. And we certainly know in the uh, resilience world, uh, people with a sense of spirituality or a sense of religion tend to tend to kind of automatically have a higher level of resilience uh, with them. So mm. I, I I think we do everybody a disservice in in medicine and in science if we just start saying, oh no, religion, uh, spirituality, it's a bunch of bunk. You're just you know you're just fooling yourself. Uh, we're shutting down a whole route of resilience, uh, as well as I think probably fooling ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And lastly, um, kind of conclude, you know, your visions of healthcare future, you know, it's, uh, it's actually, you know, going undergoing tremendous change and, you know, what do you see, um, healthcare headed next 20 years and uh, what trends innovation you believe will significantly impact the way we approach healthcare, medical education, training, um, and uh, how can people uh, follow you and find out more about you? Well, thanks. I uh, I do have my own website, and it's very easy to contact me through that. Uh, it has all my books and all that sort of stuff. It's just my name, Gary, G-A-R-Y-R, -R, and Simmons, S-I-M-O-N-D-S, so Gary R. Simmons, uh, dot com. So that one's pretty easy. I look at the future of healthcare um, and... Mm -hmm. I have big questions. I I don't know about you, Chris, but 
but I'm looking at AI, frankly, uh, and I'm wondering what the role of uh, at least primary care is going to be. Um, and eventually, as the robotics get better and better, what, what the proceduralists will be doing. But I sometimes think that we may be quickly entering into a world where you say, hey, Alexa, I'm not feeling so well today. And Alexa goes through a bunch of symptoms and has a database of billions and already knows your history because, you know, all your medical history is in it and all, all that. You probably have a smartwatch, so it knows all your vitals, all that sort of thing, uh, knows your buying habits, so it probably knows your habits and stuff like that. And maybe Alexa will go through the questions and even say, hey, put your finger in a sensor. And I mean, we're we're getting to a point where we're going to be able to do blood chemistries really just through our own sweat. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm wondering if then Alexa says, hey, you've got this here, you know, uh, we'll print up some pharmaceuticals for you and you never see a physician. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I mean, definitely has to definitely this um, whole because, uh, you know, you've got uh, just basically cost cutting a lot yeah. of um, a lot of uh, doctors are getting phased out. You have private equity. Um, so but uh, definitely this area where, um, you know, especially artificial intelligence is coming in and, you know, you start to see companies such as Amazon, like there's Amazon Health yeah. now and um, Apple's getting into healthcare. You know, once these tech companies get a stronghold in, in the um, in the healthcare, then it's off to the races. I mean, they're just going to gonna be like Netflix, you know, taking out Blockbuster. Yeah. You have uh, Mark Cuban, you know, especially the pharmacy just down the street, the CVS and Walgreens shut down because the pharmacist just walked out just because of uh, unsafe conditions. So um, you're going to see a lot, you know, like I said, huge things, um, you know, again, there's going to be bureaucracy, there's going to be regulation, all of this, you know, you know, the people in power are going to try to keep everything the same. So, but uh, it's going to be really interesting. Um, I, I uh, encourage my kids and my offspring to do other things besides medicine, which is kind of, a, you know, it's a shame, but uh, it's, if, it, you know, healthcare isn't keeping up then, but um, how can people uh, contact you and follow you? Again, probably the easiest way is just to go to my website. Uh, there is all all sorts of contact information. It has all my social media, although I'm afraid I've gotten a little mired down in, in some of the social media on current politics, but uh, I try to keep it clean on, on my website. Yeah. Yeah. And for all the audience out there, let's thank Gary for coming on. And it was really a great discussion with a fellow uh, physician colleague and uh, be sure to check out all his resources. And with that, thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. Chris, it's absolutely my delight. Yeah, that was good. I really enjoyed that. That was a good Yeah, job. me too. Yeah. So uh, I'll leave you a five-star review and, um, you know, I'll uh, follow you on all of your social media channels and, um, and uh, your episode will probably release next week. And I, uh, I think a lot of people will enjoy listening to your, you have a very nice conversational style. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you. Uh, you too. <laughs> you know, I was, I, I'm not kidding though. I'm, I'm, I actually just, I, I write some blogs for psychology today and uh -huh. I'm just working on this one right now about AI and medicine, because you know, what, what our fellow physicians do is they uh, start saying, oh, the human touch, the human touch, we got to have the human touch. And yeah. I'm like, Boy, we dropped the human touch in an awful lot of other spheres. And I think <laughs> we also anthropomorphize. Like, like I said, Alexa, if you ever talk to Alexa, I'm polite to Alexa. You know, could you please play this song for me or <laughs> something like that? And then, you know, I th this printing of pharmaceuticals is coming too. That mm -hmm. that technology is there. Yeah. And I, I could see it happening in your local corner store, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, pharmacy will be the first and it, it'll happen in, in the next few years. And then slowly it's going to be like primary care. And then finally, it's going to be the proceduralist. But uh, it's going to yeah. be really interesting. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for connecting. And I love um, I love to have you in my network. All right. Well, let's do it. Uh, stay in touch. Excellent. Well, happy new year. You too, Chris. Yeah. Take care. Uh-huh. Bye.